Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. We just had a few technical difficulties right there. But thanks for joining us this evening, and thank you for your patience. My name is Katie Starr, and I am with the Stanley Premium Western Forage Marketing Team. Stanley Premium Western Forage is a family-owned business located in southern Idaho with ideal growing conditions to raise some of the best quality forage in the country. We're here to serve you and your animals with consistent, high quality nutrition and valuable education to keep them happy and healthy. We are very excited to offer this educational webinar titled, When Quality Hay is in Short Supply, What Can I Feed My Horse? Winter brings a shortage of pasture and extreme conditions limit the quality of hay that is available. Horses need fiber for survival and to ensure proper digestion. So what do you do if you can't find it? With alternatives, how do you feed them? If you happen to be new to joining our webinars, we'll take just a minute to go over a few items so you are comfortable with viewing and participating in our webinar. If you're viewing this as a recording, feel free to skip over this section. As a heads up, we will have a couple of poll questions throughout the webinar that we will pause the presentation for you to answer. We will also be giving away some free product coupons at the end of the webinar, so you'll want to stay with us till the end. See if we can get this to progress, there we go. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. Clicking on the red box with the white arrow allows you to open and close the control panel anytime you'd like during the presentation. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed for you. You will also have an opportunity to submit questions via text to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. Please feel free to send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Depending on how many questions that come in, we may not be able to address all of them within our time frame, but we will certainly use them for future nutritional pieces and connect with you one-on-one -on -one if you reach out to us. We have also attached a nutritional paper associated with today's webinar that you can download from the control panel under handouts. For those viewing this as a recording, go to stanleyforage.com under nutrition and nutritional resources to find the handout titled, Hay in Short Supply, Horse Forage Alternatives from Stanley Premium Western Forage. This is a great take home piece for this webinar. And that is all that I have from an introductory standpoint. So please welcome Dr. Tanya Cubitt with Performance Horse Nutrition, who serves as one of our Stanley Premium Western Forage equine nutritionists. She has a PhD in equine nutrition and reproduction. And with that, I will go ahead and let Dr. Cubitt share just a little bit more about herself before she begins the presentation. Thank you, Katie, and I am excited about talking about this topic tonight. A little bit about myself, I may sound like I have a bit of a funny accent. I'm actually originally from Australia, um, and I moved here in 2001. So I've actually, I've been here quite a while um, and did a master's and PhD at Virginia Tech and now work with Performance Horse Nutrition. And we really um, enjoy working with Stan Lee, Premium Western Forage, and we uh, I, I've been having a great time doing these webinars, and I really hope that they're beneficial for you all as well. So without further ado, we will get into the topic. Um, when quality hay is in short supply, what can I feed my horse? And I think this is a really valid question for many times of the year. I know we're talking about it now as far as the winter, but there are many times of the year where this is a question that we're asking ourselves. <clears throat> so as we go through, we'll talk about the importance of forage because I really believe that's the best place to start. We need to 
um, reiterate why forage is so critical and why feeding enough is absolutely critical. And then talk about some of those al alternatives, specifically pellets and cubes, how it's made, some of the pros and cons of bagged fo forages, um, when to add them to the diet, and um, how to confidently add them to the diet. So I think we start out here. The forage part of the horse's diet, now that includes pasture, long stem hay, any fiber sources, this is the most important part of the horse's diet. As you can see, it's the bottom of the horse food pyramid. Um, and it's absolutely critical that your horse gets enough. When you look at the digestive capacity of the horse's digestive system, 65% of the digestive capacity of the horse's tract is dedicated to digesting fiber. So you can see it's absolutely critical. When we think about that, we, okay, well, what does that mean? Um, if we've got a thousand pound horse, what does that mean to me? Um, how much fiber does he actually need to eat per day? At a bare minimum would be 1% of body weight. Uh, so that would be about 10 pounds of forage for that thousand pound horse. I typically like to recommend between one and a half and two and a half percent of body weight. So that's around 15 to 25 pounds of forage or fiber per day coming in any form, long stem hay, pellets, cubes. Just remember the total fiber, no matter where it's coming from, is between 15 and 25 pounds per day. What happens if you don't feed your enough horse enough forage? Well, we get this very acidic hindgut environment, which can lead to hindgut ulcers, colic-like symptoms, or even colic, gastric ulcers, cribbing, wood chewing, and then behavioral issues. And these behavioral issues usually stem from a pain response due to that hindgut and, and stomach acidity. Not only is it important to feed your horses enough forage, but it's also how you feed them that forage. Um, horses are called trickle feeders. They're designed to have a small amount of nutrients, food, constantly trickling through their digestive system. In the wild, they were grazing around 17 hours out of the day. Chewing fiber produces saliva, which helps lubricate the throat. It helps buffer the stomach acid. When a horse puts his head down on the ground, it slows down his rate of intake, and he also produces a lot more saliva. So these are all things to take into consideration when we're supplying forage to our horses. It's not just the amount, but it's also how, how you're providing it to them. Now let's look at the benefits of pasture. Well, pasture can supply exercise. And if you've got multiple horses in a field, it's manners and socialization. But pasture is unreliable. Most of us don't have enough pasture to support our horses. It's about two acres per horse is the requirement. And that those um, acres need to be at least 75% covered in um, forage material. As I mentioned, forage pastures are unreliable. There's drought, there's snow, the different seasons, the availability. Most of the horse owners that I work with, there just isn't enough land available to have the pasture resources. But all of that being said, forage is still the most important part of the horse's diet. It is critical. So what are we gonna do? Well, let's look at this. Um, this just kind of gives us a bit of an idea of what we're talking about, the quantities we're talking about. Now, I've, I put together some numbers here, and I know we don't necessarily in all parts of the country have five months of winter, but where I'm sitting here in Virginia, I worked out with the, the wetter months of fall and the spring mud season, add that to winter, and we've got about five months where my horses are 100% reliant on me for their forage requirements. That's about 150 days. Now, if I'm feeding my horse 2% of body weight, that's 20 pounds of forage per day. That works out to be 3,000 pounds or about a ton and a half of forage that I have to feed per day. Most of our local grass bales only weigh about 40 pounds, so that can equal about 75 bales of hay per day. 
It doesn't matter whether it's baled hay or pellets or cubes, the total amount of forage that I need to feed my horse over those five months is about a ton and a half. So that makes you start to think, well, a ton and a half of hay is going to take up a lot of space. Maybe I don't have that much space. Maybe I couldn't get that much hay. Maybe I'm now starting to think about different forages or alternatives that I can add into my program to make sure my horse is still, at the end of that 150 days, I can say he got about a ton and a half over that time. So let's talk about these alternative forages, pellets, cubes. You know, we've got these conventional bale forages. We're all very familiar with those, whether they're very large bales, whether they're our regular square bales, or even the compressed bales. Stanley has some really nice, they're about 50 pound compressed bales. Um, forage cubes or pellets, and we'll talk a little bit more about how they're made. Even your chopped forage, your compressed bags that have chopped forage in there, um, and then we'll also mention some of the nutritional differences between them. So number one, how's it made? Well, we take baled forage and we want to make a small compressed bale. We just squeeze it into that compressed bale. If we want to make, take that baled forage, the forage that we cut out of the field. Now, I want you to note, we start with the exact same product whether we're taking that bale forage and we're squeezing it into a compressed bale or we're taking that bale forage and we're squeezing it into a cube or a pellet or chopping it, we start with the exact same product, premium Western forage. Now, when we make cubes, we, were, we grind it, we chop it, we grind it a little, we mix it with bentonite. Now, bentonite is a natural clay and we have to mix it with a little bit of that because the fiber lengths are longer than you will see in a pellet, we need to make sure that that cube is going to stay together. So we know that bentonite is natural to the horse. It's safe to feed. So we add a little bit of that heat, steam, pressure, and we squeeze it through this square die and out come these cubes. When we take that bale forage and we want to put it into a pellet, now we're going to grind that forage a lot finer add heat and steam and pressure and squeeze it through our typical pellet die. Now we don't need to add a binder here because we've ground that product, that forage finer, so it sticks together a little easier. Bale forage, if we want to turn it into a chop, what we'll do is we'll literally just chop it um, <clears throat> and add, we add canola oil. It keeps a nice consistent color to the product, keeps down dust. Other chopped forages often add molasses. If you have a horse that is sensitive to sugars and starches and you're trying to find a low carb forage, do not buy a chop that has molasses added. So Katie, that leads us to our first poll question. I'll hand it over. Thank you, Dr. Cubit. Our first polling question is when long stem forage or hay is processed into cubes or pellets, it loses nutritional value. And the options are true or false. Please go ahead and select the most appropriate response and click submit. Now don't worry if you're a little bit unsure of the answer, just provide your best guess. Your specific answer won't be seen by any other attendees, but we will view the total responses together once the poll is closed. Okay, it looks like mm, about 80% of you have answered. I'll give you just a few more moments to respond. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now and I'm going to share it. So Dr. Cubit, so you know, we have, um, when long stem forage is processed into cubes or pellets, it loses nutritional value. We have 11% that said true, and we had 89% that said false. Fantastic, Katie. We have a very smart group with us tonight. When we mechanically process these forages, again, I said we start with the same product, when we compress it, grind it, pellet it, cube it, or chop it, 
It doesn't change the digestibility, nor does it change the nutrient availability, um, either positively or negatively. It stays the same. It's just in a different form. The only place where we might say we've changed the nutritional value a little is with the chopped forage. When we add the oil, it can increase the calorie content. But when we start with good quality second cut alfalfa, it doesn't matter what form it's in, it stays exactly the same. Um, when we think about premium quality forage, even the best quality hay is only about 50% digestible. So if you're feeding a, gra you know, a local grass hay, that may be around 30 35% digestible. So that's why when you feed a really coarse stemmy hay, your horse makes a lot of manure because it's that non-digestible material that's passing through. So let's talk about why we would process forage. If it doesn't change the digestibility, why would we do it? Um, it's a lot about convenience. Uh, it's easier to feed. It's easier to haul. We're traveling around the countryside. Maybe we're a, a, um, a, a show barn and we want to make sure that when we leave California or we leave Florida and we go to Kentucky um, or wherever in the country we're going, we can take the exact same product without having to take large quantities of long stem hay. It's consistent bag to bag to bag to bag. It's got a guaranteed analysis on it. So by law, when we put in a bag and put a guaranteed analysis on it, it's got to be exactly the same product bag to bag to bag. Um, endless supply. It does Wherever you buy your Stanley Premium Western Forage cubes or pellets, they're not going to run out. Um, Obviously, it takes up less storage space, less waste. Oftentimes, when we put hay out, I like to feed foragers on the ground. There can be a lot of wastage. Also, um, Stanley actually has some certified noxious weed-free options. This is fantastic if you're doing a lot of that backcountry riding where um, it's the law that you take in um, weed-free products. <clears throat> What may be some of the pitfalls to feeding large quantities of pelleted or cubed forages, though? And I, I want to show you this, not to scare you away from feeding these processed forages, but I just want to show you that <clears throat> they're a good addition to the diet, but there are very few occasions where I would switch a horse 100% to a pelleted or cubed forage. And the re main reason is um, chewing. The more a horse uh, gets, the, these pictures on the right-hand side here, these are uh, the, the actual um, mandible path, so the bottom jaw, the path of that bottom jaw when a horse chews hay or pellets. And you can see he has a much wider jaw sweep when he chews hay. He's got a really wide jaw sweep to grind up that hay. But when he's got pellets, it's a much shorter jaw sweep. We know that when a horse has about two and a half pounds or 2.2 pounds of hay, um, they're going to chew it about 3,400 times. When a horse um, chews the same quantity of pellets, they take a much less time to chew it. Um, there are things that we can do to make it longer, um, but we just got to remember that horses consume pellets or cubes a lot quicker. So when do we add them? Well, they're ideal if we want some weight gain. We've got a, a local quality hay uh, that isn't the, that high in nutritional value. We want to add in some alfalfa or some alfalfa mix product that's going to boost the calorie content or even some alfalfa chop that's going to boost the calorie content of the diet. That's going to be less waste because it's all staying there in the bucket. So if you have a horse that tends to waste it, um, poor teeth. This poor guy here, if we're feeding this horse, he's not going to be consuming long stem hay very effectively efficiently. So with the pelleted forages, we can wet them and make a mash and he can literally drink it up. It doesn't matter whether a horse has teeth like that and can't chew long stem hay. He still needs that one to one and a half percent of his body weight per day in fiber. 
post colic surgery um, we oftentimes go to a lot of senior feeds because they're high in fiber I push people to use a lot more of our um, pelleted forages because again much higher in digester in that fiber um, and the reason why we do this after colic is the fiber length is already really short so it's just less abrasive on the gut it's not necessarily about digestibility but more about actual abrasiveness hind gut ulcers if your horse has been diagnosed with hind gut ulcers we know that that long stem forage can be a little um uh, irritating to the gut lining so for four weeks we recommend pelleted cubed forages and then slowly gradually um, put them back on that long stem fiber Another poll question, Katie. Thank you, Dr. Cubitt. Our second polling question is, have you fed cubes, pellets, or chopped forage to your horses before? We're going to go ahead and keep this one simple. So your options are just yes and no. Um, please go ahead and select the appropriate response and click submit. OK, most of you have answered. We'll give you just a few more moments to get in your responses. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close this poll. And Dr. Cubitt, um, we have 91% say they they have fed uh, cubes, pellets, or chopped forage before, and 9% have said no. Okay, great. So how do I add them? Typically, what we recommend is soaking, whether they're pellets or cubes, for multiple reasons. Um, you know, some horses, the, the cubes, might they might find them a little um, drier, so it increases the palatability, decreases rate of intake. For me, this is the prime reason why I soak forage products. Go back to the very beginning when I was talking about how a horse is supposed to consume forage slowly all day long. If I give him a half a bucket of forage pellets, he's just, I just know he can consume them, chew them a lot quicker. So I want to decrease, slow, slow him down. So it's going to mimic that natural grazing behavior um, and hydrates the GI tract. Most of the time we're adding these in the winter time where they're drinking a little less, they're eating a lot more um, of our processed dried forages. So overall, we just want to increase their water intake. We typically recommend a two to one water to forage um, ratio in about 15 to two minutes to two hours. I usually like cold water or room temperature water. If you're going to use hot water, make sure that you're not having them sit around all day because we just don't want those forages to ferment, especially in the summertime. Now, a question that comes up quite often is about horses choking. Oh, I don't feed my horses pellets or I don't feed them beet bulb. Or there's any number of things people say they don't feed their horse because they choke. Choking actually has nothing to do with the feed form and everything to do with feeding behavior. You could give your horse a bucket of grass and I could get him to choke on it if he eats it fast enough. So it's all about mimicking natural behavior, slowing them down. Um, oftentimes we meal feed horses. They don't have access to something to chew on 17 hours out of the day. Um, so when they see food, they inherently just consume it a lot quicker. So our goal always, when feeding anything to horses, try to put it lower to the ground and slow them down, whether that means wetting it, put a brick in it. Anything that you can do to slow the horses down will decrease your risk for choke. So let's look at how that some diets here and I want to just um, navigate you to this graph because we'll see it a couple more times on the bottom we've got digestible energy crude protein calcium phosphorus copper zinc selenium manganese iodine lysine vitamin a and vitamin e our goal with this chart is to have all of these bars touch the red line 
which is, means 100% of the horse's requirement for that nutrient has been met. You will notice that iodine in this diet is slightly low. If I add plain white iodized salt to the diet, I will balance out the diet. But we're feeding this horse 17 pounds of grass, hey? and one and a half pounds of a ration balancer, just a generic ration balancer that's going to provide all of our vitamins and minerals. He's not doing any work and he's 1,100 pounds. But let's say I don't have 17 pounds a day. I don't have enough of that hay to get me through my, my five months. Um, so how about we add in a forage pellet? We replace some of that long stem forage. I'm going to replace seven pounds with some Timothy pellets. Our diet is still balanced, but I was able to make my hay last, feeding 10 pounds a day, and I was able to add in seven pounds of the Timothy pellets. Let's just say we have really poor quality hay now. We've got a thoroughbred doing intense exercise. So I chose the outlier here. I wanted to show you the most intense animal and show you that if we can fix his diet by adding a little forage, better quality forage, then we can do it with really anything. So we're feeding him a poor quality hay, about 20 pounds a day, and we're feeding a race horse feed, about 15 pounds a day I had to add to the diet. Now, this is a good feed. I formulated this feed. I know it's a good feed but I don't want to even feed my own feed at 15 pounds a day. But with this poor quality hay, I had to, to balance the diet. So let's take that same horse, give him some better quality grass forage at 15 pounds, but I'm going to put in five pounds of alfalfa. I've, I've been able to cut back the amount of grain by five pounds just by changing my forage quality. Now, a lot of these racehorses on the track, well, you know, they're wasting, they're a little nervous. So putting the alfalfa in a tub decreases waste. Now, I'd like to see that tub closer to the ground, but adding the cubes here was able to increase the quality of our forage. So we've seen increasing the quantity. Now we're increasing the quality. What well, let's say the worst case scenario happens. All of our hay, we have a lot of hay and it's great hay, but a fire in my hay shed um, or in my area. You see over the last year, we have had some horrendous natural disasters. We've had flood and fire. Well, after flood, we can see mold. We do everything we can, but stuff just happens or we have rodent damage that we didn't know about. Let's just say we're in one of these natural disaster areas and what the disaster relief people bring in are forage pellets or cubes because they're a lot more convenient for them to bring, bring mass quantities in than to bring in long stem hay. Let's just say we were, had our horses on a grass hay and they bring in a grass pellet. Well, if you're switching from a grass hay to a grass pellet or you're just adding a grass pellet into a grass hay diet, you don't have to be as concerned about the transition. But if you are feeding an all grass diet and then the relief people just bring in an alfalfa pellet or cube, we are changing the forage type. So you do have to be a little bit more cautious. And in a lot of these situations, we don't have the luxury of that two week transition period. So if we're changing from an all grass and adding alfalfa, we have to do it quickly. You might want to add a probiotic or a prebiotic to help that hindgut accept that rapid change a little bit more quickly. The last thing I want to leave you with, over the last few years, Stanley has had uh, the opportunity to do some research with their products. Uh, we've done research on the Timothy products and then this year on the alfalfa hay, looking at, at palatability, consistency, and what that research has shown every time on the products that have been um, evaluated is this increased consistency over like products um, 
So this, this time we looked at alfalfa and compared it to a local alfalfa and the consistency of the Stanley Premium alfalfa was much higher. So what I wanna just show you here is there are a lot of alfalfa pellets, there are a lot of bagged forage products on the market, but it doesn't mean they're all the same. When you buy a product that has the Stanley brand on it, you can be guaranteed that it's going to be premium quality forage. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Cubit, for some great insight into what to do when quality hay is in short supply. Real quick before we get to the questions, I just want to remind you to download the nutritional paper under handouts before we end the webinar. And we will also be drawing very soon for our winner for free product coupons following the Q&A session. So please stick around for that. So let's go ahead and get started on a few questions that were submitted during today's presentation. Again, please feel free to still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel if you would like. Dr. Cubit, our first question is from Sue, and this is going back when you were talking about the mechanical processing. Doesn't steaming the cubes cause a loss of nutrients? No, uh, steaming the cubes doesn't cause a loss of nutrients. If you were to soak them in water and then pour that water out, like we do sometimes with long stem hay, when we're trying to leach out those sugars and starches, that will leach out nutrients. But the when we steam them, it's in an enclosed chamber and that moisture stays in the product. So we're not Le releasing that moisture, that moisture stays in the product. So those nutrients stay in the product. But that's a great question. Excellent. And Kitty would like to know, you are saying that cubes and pellets have the same water content as baled hay. It doesn't get dried out more to make into pellets or cubes? The uh, dry matter content is the same, yes. Okay. And let's see. Oh, Margot would like to know, does alfalfa really help ulcers? Excellent question, Margot. And absolutely it does. And all of this research was done down at Texas A&M and they really looked at um, young horses and they stressed them and they scoped them and they saw that they had uh, grade three and four ulcers. And then they compared feeding those young horses high grain diets and adding alfalfa or Bermuda grass hay. So it wasn't a question of they weren't getting enough forage. It was the type of forage they were feeding. And the alfalfa, because it's very high in calcium, acted as a natural buffer to that stomach acid and definitely decreased the severity and the amount of ulcers compared to when they were on the Bermuda grass hay. Okay. And let's see. Marie would like to know, I like your beet pulp over competitors, but it seems to not get as soft when soaked. Could you go through proper soaking method? For me, soaking, um, soaking beet pulp or pellets or cubes, I use the same rule, that two to one rule. Um, if you find that your beet pulp isn't soaking as well, then go to, you know, two and a half. You can always add more water. Um, try slightly warmer water, but I, I always use that two to one rule of water to, um, to forage product, be it beet pulp, cubes or pellets. Excellent, thank you. And Michaela would like to know, what probiotics do you recommend for the situation you mentioned about immediate grass to alfalfa pellet transitions in emergency situations? Really the key uh, pre-probiotic is yeast culture. Now, if it's live cell yeast culture, we can consider it a probiotic. A lot of our yeast cultures are not live, so then they're a prebiotic, but the yeast culture is is really the key. There are a trillion different bacterias in the horse's gut. Um, we don't really have a good handle on the equine microbiome yet. That's something that researchers are really working on. So we do know though that yeast 
um, helps to feed those good bacteria and we know from research that it helps to stabilize that hindgut pH. So we've made a rapid feeding change and those bacteria that produce a lot of acid, they get out of sync and they produce a lot more acid. So adding that yeast culture um, can be beneficial. Something like the probios, for example, is just bacteria. That's not one that I would use in this situation. I would use that more if I had my horse on an antibacterial, um, you know, protocol and, excuse me, all of the bacteria had been killed and we were just trying to repopulate those bacteria. So really anything that's got live cell or, or yeast culture in it. Perfect. And Michelle would like to know, so it does not matter the length of the forage for hindgut benefit? When we're talking about ruminant nutrition, cattle, yes, fiber length is very important. When we're talking, and that's because their hindgut per se isn't actually in the hind, it's in the foregut of the, of the cow. So <clears throat> their fermentation chamber is their stomach. But the horse, those that the fermentation chamber is in the hindgut, so it's already gone through teeth grinding and acid and enzymes before it even gets to the hindgut. So um, fiber length, as far as gut health isn't and digestibility isn't as important in horses. Mental health, even if I have a senior horse that cannot chew any long stem hay, they just kind of gum it around and play with it. I will still offer them about a flake a day. I know they're not actually going to consume any of it. It just gives them something to do and they still feel like a horse. They're playing with it. Great. Thank you, Dr. Cubitt. Let's see. Kathy would like to know when to feed Timothy pellets instead of alfalfa pellets. My horse is overweight. Excellent question. If your horse is overweight, feed him Timothy pellets. Do not feed him alfalfa because the alfalfa is higher in calories. If you have a horse that is hard to keep weight on or um, needs to gain weight, then the alfalfa-based products are ideal. But if you've got an easy keeper, don't feed alfalfa. Okay. And Samantha would like to know, what is the difference between hay stretcher and an alfalfa pellet? Um, hay stretcher uh, is a brand name for a particular company, and I am going to have a stab at it and say it's Blue Seal. <clears throat> Excuse me. And some of those products may have other ingredients added. Some of your... Um, forage products that aren't just hay based that you know it might have beet pulp added I don't know that particular product it's not one that I have formulated but it may have beet pulp and soy hulls also added to it okay and Peter would like to know in a crisis situation when feeding only bagged forage how do you substitute for the need for long stem forage in the equine digestive system as as we mentioned, the digestive as far as digestive function, the long length of the fiber length isn't as important. And if you're in a disaster situation, you take the lesser of two evils. And the lesser of two evils is the horse needs fiber. It needs fiber in any form. It needs fiber. So in a disaster situation, you make sure he's still getting one to one and a half percent of his body weight in that pelleted forage and as soon as you can add back that long stem forage you do it but don't think oh he's not getting long stem forage so I am going to just feed him a little bit of pelleted forage still feed him one to one and a half percent of his body weight in that pelleted forage and as soon as you can get that long stem forage back um, for more of that mental health and mimicking grazing behavior that kind of lengthening um, chewing time do that okay and Pam would like to know, what if you have an easy keeper, but they have ulcers and would like to feed alfalfa? You have to time when you feed the alfalfa <clears throat> and really just feed small amounts of it uh, and look at what else you're feeding. So in that case, you would make sure that you're only feeding a ration balancer 
and you're not feeding a grain that's giving so that you're taking away some of the calories that you might have been feeding in your grain and just do a ration balancer. Um, and then prior, just prior to exercise is when you would be getting the most bang for your buck out of feeding the alfalfa because we have this splash effect when your horse is exercising. So feeding the alfalfa a couple of handfuls right prior to exercise will give you instantaneous buffering. Or even if you, um, you know, you're trailering your horse, give him some alfalfa before he gets on the trailer again to give you that instantaneous buffering. Okay, and Shirley would like to know, is there a danger feeding all alfalfa pellets to a senior horse that needs to gain weight? He never had a large amount of alfalfa in his hay. Um, no, I mean, gradually introduce it to him and monitor his stool. Sometimes the alfalfa is highly digestible and so their stool can get a little loose. But he's also a senior horse um, and coming with a senior horse is that loose stool usually inherently anyway. So there's not a problem with feeding any horse 100% alfalfa unless the horse is overweight. The other benefit to alfalfa is it's low in sugars and starches. So that benefits the senior horse as well. Um, so as long as you gradually introduce it, and every one of us knows our own horse more than anybody else. So you monitor your own horse. Horses aren't like cows or pigs. They are diverse in their genetic makeup. They're more like people. So blanket recommendations, like blanket statements, every horse is exactly the same and you can do the same. That's wrong. So you monitor your horse. Um, but there shouldn't be a problem with feeding him alfalfa. Great, thank you. Emma would like to know, should the chopped hay be moistened for horses that don't drink a lot? I moisten everything. If I've got a horse that doesn't drink a lot and maybe has suffered from impaction colic in the past, I wet everything. Okay. Lacey asks, if I'm traveling, can I use bag forage if I run out of hay? If you're gonna replace like for like, then yes. Okay. And then, see. Marissa would like to know, after a horse founders on feed, what precautions should I use if I wanted to feed alfalfa hay, cubes, or pellets? That really comes down to, it, after he's founded, have you got his body weight under control? If yes, and you've taken away the grain, and by adding the alfalfa, it's not going to make him fat again, then it's ideal because it's low, as in, low in sugars. It gives you some protein that helps with some muscle wasting in those older horses, and especially horses with Cushing's. But again, until you get the body weight under control, alfalfa can't be part of your program. Perfect. Okay. And since we ran just a little bit late to start, we're going to go ahead and take one more question. Um, and let's see, Annie would like to know, can you feed more beet pulp and cut back on hay in a hay shortage? Um, yes, but you've got to be careful. I mean, beet pulp is a fiber, so it goes, when you're feeding beet pulp, add that into your ton and a half um, or your one and a half percent per day, 15 pounds a day. You can add that to your fiber. Note that beet pulp is higher in calories than alfalfa. So if you've got a fat horse, careful feeding too much beet pulp. If you've got a thin horse, beet pulp, alfalfa, add it. It's great. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Cubitt, and thank you for everyone attending today's webinar. We really appreciate your time and interest in wanting to learn more about nutrition for your animals. Before we wrap up, we'll go ahead and announce our winner of free product coupons now. And the winner is Margo Clark. So congratulations. We will email you to get mailing information for sending out your coupons. If you have any other questions that weren't answered during today's presentation, please contact Stanley's customer relations team. The phone number and email are available on this final slide. You can find past webinars, 
more nutritional white papers, and other great information, including the Stanley Barn Bulletin blog, and some great tools to help identify what type of forage is best for your horse and how to optimize their diet on our website at stanleyforage.com. When you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and it would be very appreciated if you would complete that for us. Your feedback will really help us to create better webinars for you and help us to identify some great topics for future webinars that we will host later this year. You will also receive a follow-up email within about 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar if you'd like to go back and reference it. And it sounds like there was probably a couple of you that had some audio issues as well. So please go come back and um, they'll be able to revisit that and view the recording. The recording should be available for a week following today's webinar and then available on our website under nutritional resources. So on behalf of Stanley Premium Western Forage and Dr. Cubit, thank you so much for joining us for this webinar and we hope that you have a great rest of your week.